Tylius Troubles, Part 71 The Second Assault Upon Viadaza Summer, 2403 Once more, Viadaza was to be the site of conflict. In autumn 2401, the dead had risen to tear their way through the streets until there were none alive in the entire city. In summer 2402, Archlector Calictus II's Grand Army had broken through the walls to retake the city from the living dead, forcing the vampire Lord Adolfo to flee. In the spring of 2403, the city fell yet again to the undead, this time almost without a fight. And although plenty of blood was shed, belonging to the foolish souls remaining in the city, a number were spared so that they might serve the cruel church of Nagash through their enforced, tormented prayers. Now, in the summer of 2403, an army the like of which had never before been seen in Tylea approached to wrest Viadaza from the undead again. The holiest army, they called themselves, consisting almost entirely of religious fanatics, the flagellating dedicants of the Disciplinati di Mor. In the summer of 2402, corpses were burned in huge heaps in the streets in an attempt to ensure they could never be resurrected to serve the vampires again. While the damage to the walls inflicted during the assault had been repaired and the earthwork bastion, studded with storm poles, which sat before the gate, had, in a spirit of optimism, been cleared away to give easier access so that the city could recover and even thrive once more through trade. All this work benefited the undead conquerors, for now the holiest army of Moor faced an unbroken wall, studded with towers, with an expanse of open ground before them, bereft of trees, cottages or cover of any kind. Not that they had need to conceal themselves as they approached, for the enemy possessed no artillery to employ against them, nor handguns or even bows. The vampire Duchess Maria watched the enemy's approach from a wall surrounded by a guard of ancient, osseous men-at-arms. The Duchess's second-in-command, the bestial vampire Lord Adolfo, his magically revivified blood, tainted by an orcan tinge, watched the approaching army from the southernmost tower, his ghouls occupying the walls and towers around him. This was the same stretch of wall he had attempted to defend during the last assault. Perhaps he had chosen to put himself there deliberately, Perhaps he was testing himself, hoping to prove he was capable of doing that which he failed to do previously. The other walls and towers were held by the vampire duchess's graveguard, while a large horde of fly-ridden zombies staggered before the gate, and a regiment of skeletal warriors marched outside the northern wall. Inside the city were a body of black knights and a spirit host, both of which were capable of moving through the stone walls to attack the foe. The holiest army had built a great wooden siege tower in the old style, correctly presuming the enemy was unlikely to have cannon or any kind of war engines to hurl missiles at it. A large body of cultists pushed this towards the tower upon which Lord Adolfo waited, while another regiment of cultists advanced upon the far left flank. Upon the other side of the tower, toward the centre of the disciplinatis line, marched a company of mercenaries with crossbows, then a large regiment of cultists containing both the Prepositus Generalis Father Caradalio and his admonitor, Brother Vincenzo. The soldiers of the Rimas city guard occupied the right of the centre, consisting of crossbows, two cannons and a regiment of men-at-arms, the latter containing the disgraced condottieri Captain Vogel and an Urbeman priest of Moor. Beyond these, upon the right flank, was Dalioni's Canone Luminoso, then Caradalio's bodyguard, then a horde of Urbeman cultists. Upon the extreme right was a company of cultist crossbowmen, behind which trotted Barone Pietro Chaibo and his guard of light horsemen. The Barone was at first unsure as to what his role could be in an assault such as this, but soon became nervously aware that he might well be fighting that day when he saw the enemy outside the walls. Behind the army was the baggage train, with yet more lesser clergy and cultists to guard it. Caradalio was very keen to ensure this was kept safe, for if he was to lead his army deep into the enemy's territory, to strike a blow at the very heart of their realm, then he would need his well-stocked baggage train intact. Of course, 
He knew that the casualties his fanatical followers would accrue would be significant, even in victory, so that each subsequent battle would be fought with rapidly decreasing numbers. But whatever warriors he had would always need meat and drink. Indeed, the inevitable dwindling of his army's strength would lend itself to the supplies in the baggage train proving sufficient for his campaign, bolstered, as with all armies, by whatever they could take along the way. A stench wafted from the city, coming as no surprise to the attacking force. The stink was made all the more sickly by the still-rotting walking corpses posted directly in front of the gate. Father Caradalio's plan was simple. He intended to utilise the fanaticism of his troops, their fearless determination to fight to the very last man, to obtain a foothold upon at least two points along the city's stone circumvallation, from which to fan out along the parapets, subsequently fighting without the disadvantage of being upon ladders. On the right, he intended the dedicants pushing the siege tower to assault the corner tower at the same moment the leftmost regiment climbed over the southern wall. That way, the ghouls and Lord Adolfo would be attacked from two sides, so that the casualties caused might be so swiftly delivered that necromantic magic would be unable to resurrect their losses sufficiently quickly. Whilst that attack was delivered, the cannons would concentrate first upon the gate and then upon a wall, hopefully creating two access points which could be employed if the walls proved too difficult an obstacle, while the massed regiments of cultists and Riemann guardsmen would seek to enter at whichever point seemed most amenable to a speedy attack after dealing with the massed zombies between them and the wall. On the far right of the line, the Abeman peasant cultists were ordered to attack the skeletons threatening the army's flank and then support the other troops as best they could. The army's significant number of crossbowmen were to concentrate their shooting at the defenders on the walls, able to aim over the heads of the massed troops advancing in front of them, in the hope that even if the casualties they caused were re-raised, the magic efforts required to do so would diminish the number of spells hurled from the walls at the advancing army. In support of the crossbowmen, the magical war engine was to target anything of significance its crew could spot upon the walls, or aim to pierce the multiple ranks of either of the undead regiments outside the walls. The vampire duchess had plans of her own. Besides manning the walls, she had boldly chosen to place two regiments outside, the skeletons and zombies. To support them, she had cunningly concealed two ethereal companies, her spirit hosts and black riders, behind the nearby walls so that they could sally out upon her command. To lend necromantic support to nearly all her troops, she placed herself at the northern end of the walls, with Lord Adolfo at the southern end, and her necromancer atop a tower between the two of them. For some time, the attackers waited impatiently, as the tower was pushed steadily towards the walls, until suddenly there was a blare of horns, a roll of drumming, and a loud cheering chant of war prayers, and the army as a whole began to advance. As the huge siege tower trundled on, the cultists to its left marched more speedily, soon catching up with it. In the centre of the field, the Generalis Prepositus wasted no time in ordering his own regiment of cultists on, towards the gate beyond the mob of stinking undead guards. As they moved, their bell rang out, its sombre tone part and parcel of the practices they employed to bring on a furiously frenzied state of being. The city guard in the centre of the line stayed put for now, but on the right the large crowd of Abemans advanced, with their lord riding up behind them. The crew on the Canone Luminoso chose the regiment of skeletons to be their first target, hoping to scorch right through the foe to bring down a whole file. By turning two geared iron wheels, they rotated the screw-like shaft, running the engine's length finally adjusting the distances dividing the giant lenses, better to suit the range of their intended flash. Then the engineer opened the shutter of a leaden lantern containing the eerily glowing gem responsible for initiating the process. The loose light projected out to reflect via two concave mirrors onto the first of the several linearly placed lenses. The glass of each lens was fashioned from a potent combination of molten, fine white sand and pounded sky stone, subsequently ground precisely into shape, to ensure the light penetrating through each of them was not only concentrated, but incrementally fed by the winds of magic, transforming from a ray of bright, hot light laced with raw magic into a beam of such heat as could turn a man to ash 
at a distance of hundreds of yards, and of such potent magical power as could instantly dissolve even the otherworldly forms of ethereal creatures. A light now appeared at the rearmost, largest lens, that which the Maestro Dalioni had called the Bonaventure lens, tinged blood red, but piercingly bright at its core. The engine began to shake, its component parts clattering so much that the draft horses, selected specifically for their docility and ability to withstand the sounds of battle, began to buck and strain at their harnesses. The engineer, clutching the rattling railing which hemmed his platform, felt his stomach knot as he realised this was going to be a more massive blast than any they had achieved in Remas during their practices. His rim of white hair suddenly stood on end, as he could hear a fizzing sort of sound, accompanied by the distinctive smell of singed wool, which presumably was coming from his own robes. There was a sound akin to a giant intake of breath, and then a searing bolt was loosed through and from the machine, which stretched right over to the skeletons, tearing apart an entire file of five into tiny fragments of scorched bone and dust. This was followed immediately by a loud cracking sound, as the mizzen lens, being the second last, broke in two. All hint of the light instantly vanished, and for a moment the engine's crew felt the breath sucked from their lungs. Once they had recovered, and quite literally regained their breath, the engineer scrutinised the cracked lens. His shoulders slumped as he realised that what had just happened would be the engine's only contribution to the battle. He caught himself just in time before taking Moore's name in vain, and began a prayer of cleansing to wash away any taint of his sinful intention. The cannons, however, had much more luck. The first sent a ball right through the zombies, splattering five of them to pieces, then continued straight into the city's gate, shattering the wood so badly that sufficient collapsed to allow men to enter, if a little uncomfortably. The second sent a shot smashing into the wall upon which the Duchess herself was stood, shaking it somewhat. The three companies of crossbowmen took down several handfuls of zombies, skeletons and ghouls. Upon the southernmost tower, Lord Adolfo scowled at the approaching siege tower. It had been fashioned somewhat simply of large planks, its only decorations being a huge painted cloth upon the front and a flag atop. Both of these sported variations of the same design, an emblem Adolfo had seen previously in both life and on death. It was one of the more popular symbols of Moor, consisting of an hourglass containing the sands of time flanked by two raven wings. It was not trepidation, he felt, nor anger, and certainly not fear, but rather impatience. He yearned to tear apart whoever lurked within the tower, to rend them limb from limb and bathe in their blood, and he wanted to do it now. As the skeletons to the north of the city advanced, and the zombies shuffled a little forwards, the vampires and necromancer on the walls conjured what magic they could to resurrect several of the fallen zombies and skeletons. The Duchess herself focused her hocus-pocus on the Abemans, conjuring a curse of years upon them to kill nine immediately. Caradalio's followers, itching to fight after many weeks of self-scourging, now thought it was the time to charge. But the siege tower failed to reach the walls, and the cultists failed to reach either the zombies or the skeletons. The exertions of their rapid march had obviously had an effect upon them, yet their failure did not diminish their desire to attack one jot. The army's priests prayed to Moore to lift the curse upon the Abemans, which the god of death graciously granted, but otherwise the holy men could effect little else. Both cannons further shook the wall upon which the Duchess stood, which at last made her wonder whether she ought to remain there, risking the ignominious fate of being buried in rubble. The other vampire lord, Adolfo, was also, in his own way, in a thoughtful mood. So keen was his passion to slay the occupants of the approaching tower that he failed even to register the large body of cultists advancing beside the tower, heading for the currently unguarded wall behind him. Once again, crossbow bolts were loosed by the dozen, this time with arrows from the horse soldiers too. But these volleys caused only a peppering of casualties, insufficient in number for the vampires or necromancer to even notice. The spirit hosts, being the bound souls of Viadaza's most ancient warriors, now issued through the stone of the northern walls. Their ethereal forms seemed woven of shadows, the upper reaches of which were, impossibly, imbued with a greenish glow. The vampires employed a cursed book, 
to wither the dedicants accompanying Caradelio and his admonitor, Brother Vincenzo. Though to look at them, you would barely have noticed the difference, such was their fury and fervour for the fight. Necromantic magic summoned a body of zombies to threaten the Abeman's flank. Then the vampires returned their attentions upon the weakened flagellants in the centre to lay low five of them with the gaze of Nagash. Of course, none of this dampened the violent enthusiasm of the advancing army. Now the holiest of armies launched several charges. In such close proximity to the foe, the dedicant crossbowmen could not restrain themselves and so charged into the newly raised zombies despite their shepherds' entreaties to show restraint. Despite their small size, their flagellations caused the death of four of their own number, and such was the fury this self-mutilation instilled that they tore down eight of the zombies, with a further loss of only one more of their own. The remaining zombies all collapsed, as the magic revivifying their rotting frames petered out. Gripped by a similar lust for battle, Father Caradalio and Brother Vincenzo jointly led their own regiment into the swollen mass of zombies before the gate. Caradalio personally cut down two of them, while his warriors slaughtered another thirteen. The still-moving zombies reeled from the blow, unable to inflict any harm back, and fifteen more of them collapsed as they also succumbed to the effects of diminishing magic. On the left of the attacker's line, the siege tower at last reached the defences and lowered its drawbridge allowing the halbeard-wielding cultists to pour forwards. Four of their own number perished to their frenzied flagellations as the god Moor filled them with an overwhelming bloodlust. They now cared nothing for their own defence, only that they could rain blows down upon the foe. The vampire lord Adolfo was waiting for them, and they now discovered just what such a creature was capable of. Eight of the cultists died from his attentions. The ghouls on the tower with Adolfo butchered three more of the cultists, while eight of their own number died. The disciplinati de more dedicants had failed to take the wall tower, losing both the initial impetus of their attack and also their frenzied mania. As corpse after corpse tumbled down from the mayhem above, one of the dedicants climbing the siege tower's ladders glanced over to the regiment, making for the neighbouring wall. In a sickening moment of clarity, despite his bloodlust, it occurred to him that unless the others ascended the wall immediately, to engage whatever was defending it, then not only would his own regiment likely perish to a man, but whoever ascended the walls, subsequently, would also be slaughtered. He was not afraid of death, for he was blessed by more, merely disappointed that if the others were a moment too late, then whatever was killing his own comrade so quickly would simply turn upon them to do the same again. Then neither wall nor tower would be taken, and More's holy army would be defeated. For the briefest moment he felt a pang of despair, but he brushed the feeling away with an angry shout and continued his climb. He was here to fight, not think. While these fights broiled, the priests managed to dispel the withering curse, affecting the Urbemans. One cannon again shook the wall violently, yet it still did not fall. But the other failed even to shoot, and the hail of crossbow bolts shot up at the walls did little more than clatter and clunk against the stones. The skeletons to the north of the walls chose not to wait for the enemy, and hurled themselves into the horde of Abemans before them. The ancient, undead warriors brought down three of the dedicants, merely matching the harm the dedicants' own scourging had caused to themselves. Such was their frenzy that the Abemans failed to notice and cut down a dozen skeletons. Near the now open gate, Father Caradalio's sword continued its bloody work, hewing apart another pair of zombies. These two truly dead corpses were joined by eighteen more, only four of the dedicants perished, three by their own flails. The last half-dozen zombies fell, as all vestiges of the magic animating them vanished. The way to the gate was clear. The necromancer upon the tower now read from his book, conjuring a curse which sapped the strength of the dedicants upon the siege tower, so that some even struggled to ascend the ladders. This did not help their fight. Three died from their own flagellations, eight more from Adolfo's attentions, and a further two perished at the hands of the ghouls. What few were left fought on, but more of them were coming to the realisation that the regiment approaching the wall with ladders was not going to make it in time to save their complete obliteration, and that this would probably mean that regiment would be destroyed in turn. The Duchess Maria finally decided to quit the unstable wall, and join her black knights in the yard below. She mounted, then commanded them to move forwards a little towards the gate, intending to charge whatever came through it. Just as Father Caradalio was about to order his regiment to assault the broken gate, Brother Vincenzo shouted, 
No, father, they are waiting in strength. He had seen the undead horse soldiers massed within, and knew any who entered there would likely be cut down to a man. Father Caradalio nodded, then pointed at the wall by the gate, commanding, Ladders! Up! At which the dedicants rushed to place the ladders and begin their climb. What resulted was short but bloody work. Even though neither the priest's prayers nor Brother Vincenzo's holy, burning water harmed the foe. Four dedicants collapsed from their own self-punishment, and another four were slain by the ghouls upon the parapet. But Caradalio beheaded two of the foe, Vincenzo another, and the dedicants smashed five skulls. The few ghouls remaining were overwhelmed, and with a leap, Caradalio and the first of his dedicants were on the wall. The climb was considerably easier for the cultists at the southern wall. As they clambered over, they did not yet know that the vampire lord Adolfo and his ghouls had already defeated the dedicants on the siege tower. All forty were either dead or maimed so badly that they could no longer fight. A good number wounded by their own hands. Outside the walls, the crossbow-carrying cultists charged into the flank of the much-diminished regiment of skeletons, and between them and the Urbemans they cut every last one down. The crossbowmen, realising that the spirit hosts were behind them, moved over the bony remnants to put a better distance between them and a foe they could not hope to harm, while the Abemans reformed themselves as they realised they could become the spirit host's chosen target. Behind the Abemans, the torch-wielding dedicants of the Prepositus Generalis's bodyguard manoeuvred as best they could, frustrated in their efforts, knowing that their blessed, burning torches could easily dispatch the spirits, if only they could get to them. While one cannon was being made ready again, after its earlier misfire, the other cannon sent a shot that brought down the parapet of the wall where, until moments before, the Duchess had been standing. Four of the grave guard were buried in the rubble, and three more succumbed to the crossbow bolts and the light horseman's arrows, which found their marks much more easily now that there was no crenellated parapet in the way. The rest of the guards simply stood as they were, entirely bereft of any trepidation concerning whether the wall was about to collapse fully. At the very moment the leading dedicants upon the captured southern wall turned towards the door, into the tower, it burst open with such force as to rip it off its hinges, and Lord Adolfo, filled with a furious rage, leapt out to tear into them. He was followed by his ghouls, and the fight that ensued was even bloodier than previous. Adolfo alone killed eleven cultists, while the ghouls cut down another nine. What with another cultist perishing from his own self-scourging, it all added up to twenty dead cultists, while only seven of the ghouls had been killed. Nevertheless, the dedicants of the Disciplinati de More fought on, more and more clambering over the parapet to die almost instantly, even though none now harboured any hope that they might survive. Father Caradalio, however, and what few warriors were left to his regiment, were doing better, losing only five of their number whilst killing nearly twice as many ghouls. Such was the weakening of the necromatic forces binding the ghouls that the necromancer with them now succumbed to true death, along with the one or two ghouls remaining. Just before entering the round tower beside him, Caradalio looked down into the city, and his eyes locked with his greatest enemy, the vampire duchess herself. She was sitting, side-saddle, upon a red barded steed, looking deceptively delicate in her posture, while there was nothing but pure evil in her eyes. Caradalio smiled. Such was his joy at leading his holy warriors into battle, knowing that more was by his side. The Duchess snarled and watched through narrowed eyes as the priest stepped through the door out of her sight. He had but three warriors left with him, and his admonitor, Brother Vincenzo, yet he still had confidence that victory would be his. Captain Vogel's elite palace guard were approaching the gate, with the Abeman priest among them. The cannons were still booming, and every undead warrior outside the city had been killed. What he did not know, until he got to the top of the tower, was that Adolfo had now slain the entire second regiment of dedicants attacking the southern wall. With a little help from his ghouls, and the enemy themselves, he had obliterated seventy dedicants. All the while, he had been reanimating his fallen warriors, so that when he left the wall and hurtled down the street immediately behind, heading towards the Duchess, he still had ten ghouls with him. The spirit hosts passed back through the city walls, intending to attack whatever force attempted to climb the northern wall, even as it did so. The Duchess now decided that her black knights could surely deal with whatever came through the gate on their own, so she leapt from a mount and made her way 
into the round tower immediately north of the gate, with a mind to fight through whomsoever got in her way and kill the laughing priest. Before she could reach the wall on the southern side of the gate, however, Captain Vogel and the palace guard employed the same ladders Caradalio and the cultists had used to ascend the wall. Meanwhile, Father Caradalio had reached the round tower's top and peered over to spy Adolfo, loping down the street below. Feeling Moore's wrath flow through him, he conjured Moore's curse upon the vampire, followed by Moore's glare, which stung so badly that Adolfo stumbled and almost fell. The battered wall occupied by the graveguard had been hit several more times and was now on the verge of complete collapse. A man leaning on it might cause it to topple. Several more skeletons had been killed by crossbow bolts and the rest of the Holiest Army's regiments had moved closer to the walls. The Abemans and a company of crossbowmen were ready to attempt charges to capture more of the walls. The Duchess Maria had sensed her servant's anguish at the stinging power of the enemy's prayers and it suddenly dawned on her that if she and Adolfo attacked the walls and the tower, they could almost certainly cut down all opposition, and most likely even the two priests of Moore. Yet there was a small and real chance she could fail. Adolfo had been weakened, and if only one Moorite survived, that might be sufficient to finish him. She knew not what other tricks these priests had up their sleeves. The wall behind her was about to collapse, and Moorites were closing in to capture several other sections. She had sent most of her army's fighting strength away to the south, with Biagino, and this guard force she had kept here in Viadaza had proved too weak, if only just, to defend against these cultists. The enemy's dead were piled high, yet still they came on in frenzied fury, fearing neither death nor undeath, and they fought to the last. If but one remained, he would run at her, not away. Maria loved her own death, so much that she wanted it to last forever, and she was not willing to take needless risks. Her decision was made quickly, her command given immediately. Leave! All her servants heard her, for they were beholden to her will, and could sense her very thoughts. The black knights galloped down the high street from the east gate, while Adolfo led his ghouls down another parallel street. In fact, it was the very same street he had fled down the previous year when the arch lecture of Rimas had attacked Viadaza. The irony was lost on him. The rest of her army, the Duchess included, slipped away through interconnected cellars and attics, crossing vestibules and arches, down passages and alleyways, towards the waterfront, where boats awaited them. Once again, the undead had yielded Viadaza to a Riemann-led army. But the Duchess was far from defeated, merely inconvenienced. She would raise more servants wheresoever she went and destroy this foe in her own good time. Her enemies' losses in this battle would be much, much harder to replace. <laughs>